Right, good afternoon everybody and welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your um, breakout sessions um, from what I could see there's loads of good um, discussion and, and debate um, going on there um, and an action packed today we've had um, thus far. Um, now earlier on today we were talking about um, uh, the sort of there's a whole set of national policy initiatives for young people's employment and skills, but also a lot of local uh, and regional and local government initiatives and a really important role about stitching all of that together so it makes sense for young people and young people A, are engaged and B, end up on the right set of support for them. Um, so I'm really, really delighted that uh, uh, to give us a, a keynote uh, discussion this afternoon, we have uh, Steve Rotherham, the mayor of the Liverpool city region uh, and re-elected for a second term um, earlier this year on a, an increased majority. And I know that um, uh, the mayor and uh, the Liverpool city region have done lots of stuff in terms of helping people hit during the pandemic by the economic effects of it. Uh, and in particular, those young people who I described earlier hit by a double whammy of um, disrupted education and weaker job opportunities too. Uh, but also um, having a key priority to think about, well, where do we go next and how do we build the sort of future of the young people that we want to see and also tackle some of the, those challenges that we had before the pandemic that we've been talking about during the course of today as well. So, Steve, we're really pleased that you could uh, you could join us. I'd encourage everybody um, to please put your questions into the uh, chat function and we'll try and put as many of those um, across as possible. But uh, Steve, for, for now, um, over to you and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Um, great to be here this afternoon and, and a bit like yourselves, I've just uh, had a, a meeting uh, with the, the Employment Minister and with Minister Davis and I'm, I'm hoping that what I've got to say, some of what I've got to say anyway, resonates with what she had to say earlier today. I mean, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, I know it's a virtual summit. I, I'm about teamed out and zoomed out. Um, so I can't wait to actually meet together um, and see the reaction of human beings. Um, I've just come back from, from London where I've spent two days at the Global Investment Summit. And at that meeting, which was, you know, person to person, business to business, there were um, organisations that were represented that had a combined wealth um, for investment of $24 trillion. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but I, I was very impressed by that statistic. And what we're trying to do is to get more of that into the Liverpool City region so that we can create some of those jobs. And that's what I want to talk about um, in, in a second. I mean, I, I need to to thank, of course, the Learn and the Work Institute for offering me the chance to, to give my perspective on employment and skills and the landscape around young people, specifically, in all honesty, about the Liverpool City region. But what we're doing here, of course, can be replicated elsewhere. And skills is really huge for me. I, I always try to find time in my diary for events relating to employment and skills. Um, it's something I'm genuinely really passionate about. And that's probably because I, when I left school at 16, I became an apprentice bricklayer. Um, I then went on to be what's called a business manager for something called the Learning and Skills Council. But that was a role overseeing apprenticeship delivery in the Merseyside area. And now, of course, I'm implementing a transitional and transformational vision for skills as the Metro Mayor of the Liverpool City Region. So really, uh, that brings my life full circle. And in the area that I'm fortunate to represent, I describe the picture currently as mixed when it comes to employment and skills. You know, in, in my first term, we were able to do some really valuable things to improve opportunities and life chances for lots of young people living here. We, for instance, halved the price of travel for apprentices on buses and rail to make it more attractive as a route into employment. We created something called Be More. It was the country's first UCAS style apprenticeship portal that connected local people with local opportunities and it actually won some international awards. We put about 50 million pounds into improving facilities in schools and colleges. And if you think of all that, that was from a standing start. 
and I, you know I'm proud of what we, we've achieved. Um, but I'm, I'm still as excited and optimistic as anybody about what we will deliver next. Of course, all of that is against the backdrop of COVID. And, you know, those first few months after we locked down were some of the most depressing imaginable, I suppose for everybody, but for young people, certainly who were hoping to enter the labour market. You know, large swathes of the economy had shut up shop and firms weren't recruiting new staff. Some apprentices actually were made redundant from their roles due to the financial pressures on companies. And many schools and college leavers were left uncertain at best about what the world of work looked like for them. So I was genuinely fearful of a return to the situation that I faced in the 80s. Uh, you know, it was a wasted decade where um, an era of many young people's talents that weren't realised, you know, that their potential went untapped and their career prospects were curtailed. And nobody wants to see another generation failed. Now, using the sort of the levers of the combined authority, we've been able to put some support in place. So for instance, we used our online platform, that thing I just said, Be More, um, to help redundant apprentices find new suitable opportunities. And we provided about a million pounds worth of IT equipment to tackle digital exclusion um, as much as we could. And all of this was together, and, and I suppose in complementarity with what the national programmes such as Kickstart were offering, um, which for all its faults was at least an attempt by the government to prevent that lost generation that I spoke about earlier. So 18 months on now from the pandemic, and I'd like to think, fingers crossed, that we're finally coming out of the other end, and therefore our attention is turned to what happens next and where do we go from here. So for me, first and foremost, just because the health crisis may have subsided, it doesn't mean that the unemployment emergency has passed us. I checked the latest ONS figures, I've just been speaking to the minister, as I say, and uh, around 12,000 young people in our area classed as unemployed, and that's about 12.5% of 16 to 24-year-olds. And look, while it's a percentage that's a little bit lower than the national average, that's not good enough for me. And so I resolved to do something about it. And in my election manifesto back in May, I proposed a young person's guarantee, and this is an, a commitment to all 16 to 24 year olds living in our area um, that are unemployed for more than six months, that we will guarantee them a job or an apprenticeship or a training opportunity so that we can get them back on their feet. And as I say, it's not a rival to kickstart. Um, it's something I think is better, but it's more bespoke. Uh, and after all, we can respond far more quickly to the needs of our own people than any sort of politician in Westminster or any civil servant or white old Mandarin. So we know our area best and we know what we need to do for our areas. And I suppose that's the very essence of devolution, this thing that we've got with central government where we, we get powers and you, you have something called a metro mayor uh, in 10 areas of the country. And what we're doing with the young person's guarantee is it's the offer of hope, isn't it? You know, the, the chance to succeed, um, a, an opportunity of a brighter tomorrow. So I'd like to think that both that hope and the reassurance that we're given uh, means that we won't have young people um, in a, you know, a more volatile and uncertain world being the lost generation like it was for many people in the 80s. So as well as flagship policies like the ones I've just mentioned, we're also continuing to enhance delivery in a number of key areas because, of course, it is about giving people a chance, but it's also creating some of those new opportunities of the future. And we're working with local head teachers and um, the Liverpool City Region Growth Platform to improve careers advice. And we've rolled out a network of eight 
youth hubs across the uh, area and Holt knows Liverpool since I was seven and the Wirral. Actually, I think it's more than that. Uh, I've just been on a call and, and the minister identified 12. So um, it's a significant you know, improvement. And we're continuing to recognise the achievements of those people who qualify with a technical education um, with formal graduation ceremonies. And I think that really starts to develop that parity of esteem. You know, because somebody does a vocational course, it's of no less value than somebody who goes through academia. And I'd argue, in fact, it gives some people additional skills over and above, uh, over and above the regurgitation of information at university. I'm not uh, having a pop at unis. I'm just saying for some people, vocational routes are better. And early next year, we're going to host a skills roadshow that will be attended by well over 3,000 people. And that's going to be about pushing vital career paths, you know, getting more people into STEM. STEM is going to be huge. We certainly need to be getting um, more women, young girls into to STEM subjects um, so that they can get the careers which are the high value, high paid jobs of the future. So I'm really excited about what we can do with skills over the next few years. Um, and that's because I, I can look at what we're doing strategically and know that there's going to be some really, really good jobs um, that haven't yet been created, but will be in the next few years. And so to help us do that, for instance, we're looking at the fourth industrial revolution around digital connectivity, for instance. Um, and, and again, we're ahead, ahead of the country. We're, we're putting 212 kilometres of dark fibre into the grounds as we speak uh, in all of those six local authority areas. And by the time that this is completed, we'll have developed a loop spanning the whole city region. And that digital infrastructure will mean that our area has the fastest internet speeds in the UK, possibly in Europe. And that, that's, you know, we're going to find that businesses want to come here because of that. But also, there will be some young people who are the entrepreneurs of tomorrow who will find applications to use that infrastructure. And it's not just a one-off. Um, there are lots and lots of other areas where we're doing the same sort of thing. We're not we're not just responding to the demand or what the market is. We're actually creating and disrupting the market and creating those opportunities. And lots of our young people will be um, gearing up for those jobs in the future, you know, in four or five years' time. Um, maybe others might look to replicate what we're doing, but there will be different types of jobs with new skills that will be needed, required as a prerequisite for those um, types of jobs. And so young people will be entering a lucrative sector. You know, it pays handsomely. These are, are good jobs with a guaranteed pipeline of work. And that means, you know, you won't go through what I went through at school. Um, so it's a, a, a real contrast to what, you know, the 80s were um, for this generation now. Because you can end up with a job for life in some instances. Uh, and, you know, that's not been offered to many people in the last few decades. So it's really good. And, and other types of opportunities are around the green industrial revolution. You know, um, part of that, we're doing a program of retrofitting housing. Because about a third of our carbon emissions in the Liverpool city region currently come from poorly insulated homes. And so we need to do something about retrofitting those properties. And that work has actually started already as I speak. We've got a small program at the moment of 1,200 homes being retrofitted, but that's by local tradespeople and local companies. And that will be finished by March. And that's really a pilot, a forerunner of what we want to do. We want to scale that up and scale it up to you know something hugely uh, more impressive. We've actually asked the government for half a billion pounds through the Comprehensive Spending Review for this gigantic programme of retrofitting. And all of that, of course, will help us achieve our net zero carbon targets, which is 
uh, by 2040, um, 10 years ahead of the government in our area. So lots of good stuff for, for young people in the, the decades ahead. And I'm not the first person to say it, but you know that thing about a young person starting in a sector in an industry and then potentially looking at staying in that sector for the rest of their lives, um, it, I think that's a game changer for us in the city of Eugene. Um, and then if I just quickly I give you some of the headlines, as a combined authority, since I, I was the, the Metro Mayor, we've created some like 10,000 jobs and 7,000 apprenticeships. And, you know, as I say, from a standing start, that's not bad. We've just, you'll have read, hopefully, that we've approved a decision to contribute to the construction of Everton Football Stadium. Uh, and that's going to create about another 8,000 employment opportunities. And over the last few days, we've had some unbelievable announcements. Ford, for instance, are going to build and manufacture their e-engines, their lucky engines, uh, in Hellwood. And that's going to keep the 500 to 750 jobs there. But the supply chain is huge for that. And, and the, the workforce will increase, of course, as demand increases. So um, that's really good. And then just yesterday, you know, we, we, we've been working with government, I'll, I'll say kindly, um, to try to get them to support something called HiNet, and that's the production of hydrogen and the storage of carbon um, in the city region and across the whole Northwest, myself and Andy Burnham and the leaders uh, of the uh, large uh, local authorities have all pulled together. And, and we've got that one over the line. For young people, these are literally transformational projects. Um, and so all of that good news, if you like, is, is part of how we're trying to diversify our economy and look towards the, the challenges that we have with climate emergency, but also the opportunities that presents. And we've got the solutions as a combined authority working on behalf of the 1.6 million people that we represent. We are making a difference. Um, and just like, I suppose, the Learning Skills Institute, um, what they've been doing for the last 20 years or so, um, we wanted to press on and we want the next 20 years to be more successful than the last 20 years. So I'll leave it at that and happy to answer any questions, but thanks for having me and keep up the good work. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, it's great to hear that sort of overall vision, but then also a set of concrete actions to, to try and deliver it as well um, and that, that are underway now. Um, I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions um, that, that sort of came to my mind as you were speaking there as well. And then I can see there are questions coming in via the Q&A as well. So do keep putting them on there and I'll, I'll, I'll go through as, as many as I can. Um, so the, the first thing I wanted to ask, um, because you talked about the young person's guarantee that you've introduced, which is fantastic to see. That's something we, we've argued for for a long time. So it's absolutely brilliant to see. One of the things we were talking about earlier today is there's lots and lots of initiatives for young people. But first of all, how, how do you go and get them? How do you go and find them and engage them? And secondly, how do you make sure they end up in the right thing for them rather than just whatever particular agency happens to find them has on offer. So can you just say a little bit about how, how, you, how you're trying to tackle some of those issues? Well, the first thing is, and I mentioned it during the speech, is having independent careers, advice and guidance. It's absolutely essential. When I was leaving school, um, I went to a careers officer and they said, um, you can either go on a building site or in the army. That's basically what somebody like me was, was offered with. Um, and of course, in later life, I went on and did a master's degree. So it wasn't um, that I didn't have the, the, the talent or um, the acumen. It was about opportunity. So that's what I want to do, create opportunity. And therefore, we, we, we need to, to do it in a way that young people can access those opportunities and they do it online. You know, my generation didn't and, and still don't in many instances. So be more was designed by young people with young people in mind. It wasn't old farts like me saying, I think I should do this for, and that's why it's been so successful. So we've got all of those opportunities there. Um, you can access it all on your phone or on your laptop. Um, and, and in that way, young people can have a more informed debate 
around what their individual futures are. And I think we will, you know, we'll see the benefits of that uh, as um, the young person's guarantee grows across the whole city region. Yeah, no, I completely agree. The sort of, um, well, I won't tell you about my, my career's advice. You had to fill in the questionnaire and it, it went off and then a computer printout came back giving you the three things you could pick from, which kind of was a bit of a surprise three weeks later. <laughs> so I complete, completely, completely agree with agree with that. And that sort of no wrong doors approach so that kind of wherever you you, you turn up, you get that independent advice. Um, absolutely critical. Um, I, I wanted to sort of pick up on something you were saying there as well about um, you want to create opportunities for young people and then sort of help them get into the right one for them. And you, you talked about um, the sort of green te- uh, green jobs and also the the, the broadband um, stuff that you're doing there as well and creating good quality jobs. Um, I just wonder, sometimes um, in central government, if I can put it this way, there seems a, a bit of a disconnect between, you know, we're investing this much money in these sort of shiny things over here and it seems a bit disconnected from the how am I going to get to help a young person to get those jobs or encourage or require in some cases an employer to open up those opportunities so can you how, how are you putting those two sides of the equation together? I, I want to create opportunity and I, I obviously I, I get to speak to um, the government including the Prime Minister at times unfortunately um, but I've said to them all, and actually Johnson's robbed a little bit of this of me, so I kept on saying, it's not that we lack talent in our area, it's that we've not always had opportunity. So if we wait for opportunity, it's never, ever going to come to us. We need to create opportunity. And is this fourth industrial revolution, of course, with all of the wonderful uh, technology and, and the the likes of AI, um, and AI can be used for good. I mean, for many people, they, they see it as a threat. I, I think, for instance, in in, um, in health, um, it can be a wonderful thing. Over the last 18 months, the worst place for people to be was a doctor's surgery, for instance, or a hospital because of coronavirus. And so if you can sit in your own home and using technology and using artificial intelligence, you could be diagnosed um, so, for instance, not just with coronavirus, with health conditions at home, then that, that technology can help to arrest the health disparities that we have in the Liverpool City region, for instance, you know, where people have life expectancies 20 years less than when I used to work in Westminster. You know, and, and so it's, it's horrendous. So we can use a lot of that, that stuff. And then there's the Green Industrial Revolution. If we're really serious about saving this planet, and that's where we're at at the moment, not improving, saving the planet, then we have to look towards the Green Industrial Revolution and the jobs that will come out of that. And we think that we can create about 10,000 jobs in that. So they are currently, they don't exist, these jobs. You know, the, the, the things around um, the climate emergency, um, we're talking about, carbon capture and storage, what will that look like? What sort of skills will be necessary for that? If we're talking about um, heat exchanges and uh, other um, networks that are um, environmentally friendly, who's going to do them sort of things? You know, we're, we're, we're doing retrofitting of housing. Who's going to do that? We want young people to have the requisite skills so they can do that. But like me in the 80s, if demand um, starts to, to dwindle, it will be somewhere else. They can go and take those skills and earn a living somewhere else. So that's what I want to do, really. I don't want people to go through what we did as a generation in the 80s, which was literally, it was it was a very bleak time for us all. And, and it's been, you know, youth unemployment really did spike up during the, 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 the pandemic, but is is recovering a bit now and things like, as you say, kickstart all the, all the flaws and everything. But... You know, there, there is a lot of stuff going on to try and prevent that, what happened in the 80s, um, which, is, which is good. Um, but I think there are, there are some particular groups of, you know, we say young people as a whole, but there's, there's, there's a sort of whole diversity within that. And, and Martin from the National Deaf Children's Society has asked about disabled young people in particular who can face particular or significant barriers into employment. So not just around how they can access work because, you know, uh, with their disability, but also 
a lot of other things there as well. So I, 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 I'm sure there's lots of stuff you're doing around um, supporting disabled young people, but I just kind of maybe um, there's, the, there's the sort of what you're doing for that group, but also how you differentiate between groups of young people more generally as well. Yeah, of course. And it's a great question, isn't it? Because, I mean, there are many forms of disability, of course, and, and, and you know, there's neurodiversity as well. That uh, is a consideration. Now, we've put something called the Fair Employment Charter together, and we've worked with lots and lots of different groups, including all of the protected characteristics. And we, I think we've got something that encourages employers to look differently um, perhaps um, than they have previously um, about diversity and about people, for instance, with disabilities in the workplace. And of course, what we can do is we can help as well, because if there are things that an employer needs, there, there, are, there, are, you know, there are areas of support out there. So there's, there's good stuff. Listen, by the way, could, could we do even more? Yeah. Yeah, and we could and we should. And we probably will be making some announcements early next year about the type of thing that we want to do further. Great. In fact, we'll watch this space, basically, for, for more, to, more to come on that. Um, I, I've got another question here from um, Eleanor, who asks about um, digital exclusion, because you were, you were talking about the sort of... Um, uh, super fast broadband and that which sounds like it has the potential to be really transformative for people and for businesses and you talked about some of the investment in the pandemic that you made about digital exclusion but I, I guess more, sort of more broadly as we look beyond the pandemic and we published a report last Friday showing I think about 13 million people across England have got low digital skills so it feels like that's dropped down the national political agenda with along with literacy and numeracy actually over the last um uh, last 10 years or so and we can't unlock those opportunities unless we've got that sort of core set of literacy numeracy and digital skills so is that a kind of priority for you as you look ahead as well the, the government cut 80 percent from the budget uh, to tackle um digital exclusion 80 percent so we stepped in and we spent a million pounds of funding that i'd, I'd raised um, not from the government, by the way, but from, you know, crowdsourcing and all sorts of other ways to help out because a lot of people who are from the most disadvantaged communities, they're getting hit with the double whammy of not being able to afford hundreds and hundreds of pounds for, a, you know, a tablet or a laptop or whatever it might be, but also the 16, 18 pounds per month connectivity you know the the actual money that they pay to virgin or to uh to bt or whatever it might be and so we we want more support for that and again we've put very comprehensive plans to national government because otherwise what will happen is those people who are already disadvantaged will be further disadvantaged as blended learning um, starts to become a you know a thing of the future as well as a necessity of, of the pandemic so yeah, it's a it's a huge issue for us. I've met with BT Open Reach, I've met with Virgin, I've met with um, Talk Talk, and we're going to be announcing some things in the next few weeks. Certainly with Talk Talk about specific groups, we can't do it for everybody. So we're going to start with um, care leavers and, and one or two other groups. But we 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 are doing some really good stuff here, and I, I, I'm I'm really open to to be a test bed. You know, to, to pilot stuff um, because we'll get the ban advantage of that and then if it works it can be rolled out across the country. Yeah I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned care leavers actually we do a lot of work around care leavers who um, 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 are disadvantaged in a whole set of ways uh, across a whole, whole set of things so I think I um, can't remember the proportion off the top of my head but a significant proportion have spent two or three years not in education employment or, or, or training um, um, and so I'd love to come and uh, talk to you about that um, uh, separately afterwards as well. But it feels like there are groups like that that too often miss out. And actually, you as the mayor have some real power to, to reach across to, to those to those groups. So I'm really pleased to see that's that's on your priority list. Do you want to maybe just say a little bit about um, how you're trying to support those? Because presumably you're, you're needing to work with the local authorities within your city region as well as the work you're doing directly. 
Yeah, th this is only something that has come out in the last two weeks, so we can't. I'm not, I, I'm, this is not the platform to announce it, um, but we, we can't say too much because yet you, you have to get these things tied down. So we, you know, I want to sign the contract and all that sort of stuff. But it means that we have specifically looked at what we can do to help and assist for that cohort of people. Um, often it was sort of like a cut adrift. You know, they, they, they have had support. And all of a sudden it's like, you're on your own. And that's where difficulties start to, to exist. But of course, you mentioned uh, the NEAT group, the Not in Education, Employment and Training group. Uh, and again, uh, I'm not sure whether Rob Tav is on this call, um, but if he is, he's done some great work um, heading up the command authority's response to that. And, and again, to another cohort that we will be saying a little bit more about, but we're already doing with some really good stuff. It's just that as we access further pots of money and the ability to have flexibility around funding streams that we can do a little bit more. Um, government can strain us far too much with what we can spend stuff on. And I keep on saying, we know what our area needs. You know, government can butt out and, and, and we'll do what we think is right for our area. If we get it wrong, we have an assurance framework with the national government, but if we get it wrong, I'm held to account. I have to stand up every three or four years and be elected or not. So there is accountability and responsibility. There you go. And uh, if Rob's listening, we will clip that element of what the mayor said there about you. So you can kind of use that for your future reference internally. Um, so we're kind of coming into the last sort of five minutes or so. And I wanted to sort of um, pick up on a question from Dominic Jones, but also you, you, you talked earlier about um, some of the asks that you've got into the spending review to help you with some of, some of that vision. And we also have a levelling up white paper coming at, at some point um, uh, this year, we, we, we think as well. So what, what's the kind of, you know, you need more money to do stuff, particularly after so much stuff has been cut over the last 10 years. But what else do you need from, from government to allow you to turn what was an amazing vision into that reality? We need support, and it's not just financial support. Um, you know, I, I want to build a, a Maisie Tidal project. And for lots of reasons, if you think about this, the environmental crisis that we have, but also about those jobs of the future, it, it will provide energy which is predictable, plentiful, and of course, renewable, proper green energy for 120 years. 120 years. So we need the government to support us on these things, big visionary transformational projects. Um, we need the government to do what it says it wants to do, to level things up. I, I said earlier I was a bricklayer. So that was my job. I used to level things up. You know, used, every course had to be level. So I understand that you don't level things up by areas that are higher, giving them more, and leaving areas that are lower, less. That's not how you level up. And we've had a decade and a, and a bit of austerity. Um, and so our local authorities have been hollowed out. You know, all of them have faced more than half of their budget being cut half. And if you think about that as a, yourself or your family, just imagine if you'd have half of all of that money that comes into the household cut. And that's what they've had to do and try to respond to that as best as they could. What we want to do is look at growth now and investment. So not handouts. Keep on saying to government, we have to do something called a, a, a bit, an outline business case and then a strategic uh, business case. And there's a methodology to calculate what the return to government is within that. And all of ours have got a good multiplier effect. So the government gives some money to the, the project or invest some money in the project and they get the return on it. And that's how we're going about things. But we need them to step up to the plate and do what they said they want to do. All my levelling up references are computer games related, which I think suggests a misspent year. So yours is better. <laughs> um, last last question for, for me, I guess. Um, and then I know I know we have to have to wrap up. Um, so you, you talked about your background and and how you got into um, an apprenticeship, and that's kind of um, that was your kind of start out, if you like. Apprenticeships for young people have gone from low before the apprenticeship levy reforms to very low, and then to very very low. <laughs> 
um, through the pandemic, but also we've we've just generally in this country had lower take up of vocational options and the government's answer is the T levels, but there's a lot of concern which I would share about cutting funding for things like BTEX before we know those uh, work, for example. So um, I'm just kind of, uh, this might be a bit, tell me if it's too too much detail, but I'm kind of interested in your thoughts about T levels and BTEX, but also kind of vocational education and apprentices more generally and how we really level that up to, co to coin a phrase. The first thing that any government should do is listen to the experts. It's what they always said about the pandemic, you know, the science is, is pointing us in this direction or the experts are telling us X, Y, or Z. So why don't we do it with skills and education? And the sector was saying that whilst T-levels could be something that worked, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's what the government basically uh, are doing. So for me, um, what I'd like to see is the commitment to provide a proper apprenticeship. And I'm talking about an MVQ level three out outcome. I think level two is good on the way to achieving the, um, the sort of gold standard. But that's where we should be going, level three. And then if people can progress onto fours, fives, great, great. Um, and at this global investment summit that was at in London, both Rishi Shunak and Boris Johnson talked about the skills agenda. And I have to say, they were right to mention it because businesses can't um, grow and improve unless they have skilled people. So the right to, to have highlighted the fact that we need to do more on it. But I was frustrated about the glib nature of what their basic understanding of skills needs are. And, and skills needs are, you know, a, a multiple of different and competing factors. And I think, you know, because Boris Johnson's talking to, you know, the, the sort of the FTSE 100 type companies, that, that's a very different skills need than many of the businesses, which are micros, with certainly SMEs in our area. You know, they need people um, with stuff that's happening now. There are vacancies, by the way. So if there are vacancies, and some of them are decent paid vacancies, why aren't we training people for those vacancies? Give them the skills, give them the apprenticeship, give them the route into the world of work. And it's not rocket science for me. So, yeah, I'm hugely frustrated at the whole skills agenda. I head up the skills agenda for the Northern Powerhouse and because of my background. And I'm every conversation I have, and it doesn't matter who it's with in regard to businesses, it starts with something else, but it ends up around skills. And then it ends up around how can we upskill or how can we you know, create more apprenticeships or whatever it is. So there's a desire there, just needs more delivery from this national government. Yeah, I completely agree. There's a, yeah, there's a need and there's a desire and we haven't quite sort of connected the two across. No, I completely agree. Um, Steve, sadly, we're, we are out of time. To be honest, I could have gone, gone on for much longer, but I'd have got in, got in trouble. Um, I, I really, really, I really appreciate your time this afternoon. And also, that was just such a compelling vision of what you're trying to do um, and linking the sort of opportunity creation with the people that need the opportunity as well. So there's so much good stuff going on there and also really concrete action. Um, and fingers crossed that the, the spending review and the levelling up white paper deliver on some of those asks as well. So a huge thank you to you. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call does as well. Um, I'm going to hand across um, to Sam and to Josh to wrap up, but I will just very quickly before I do so, say a huge thanks to all of the speakers today and to Impetus and the Edge Foundation for, for their support. And I also want to say thanks to Sam um, and to the whole of the learning and work team who've worked incredibly hard to put together an action-packed event. So a big thank you from me to them. And with that, I'll pass across to Sam. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you very much, Steve, as well. What a, a great way to round off this summit. Uh, what a great time to be talking about these things as well. So uh, we, we've, you know, it's it's just before the spending review, one week to go. People are busy making their uh, sort of submissions and their final details being tied down for that. So we're really pleased to have had the minister here this morning with her 
so very enthusiastic support and making announcements as she spoke about extending some of that support as well. Um, I, I think some of the reflections on the first panel uh, from those really key regional and local stakeholders, uh, you know, what, what are they wanting to see? Things like single fund and pots, a focus on those who are furthest away from the labour market. Uh, what, and that question sort of what are we going to do differently is a really powerful one. Uh, then, then the employers that we heard from, uh, big schemes, big targets, big visions there. Uh, how, how are we tying some of those uh, schemes together for young people and giving them the opportunities? I think that was a great panel to hear from both the government side and from employers. Then I went on to my, my the breakout I went to on youth hubs. The, the powerful message was the local model works. Uh, you know, it's really working for young people in their local areas. I hope your breakouts that you went to were equally as insightful. And last but not least, hearing from the mayor uh, for Liverpool City Region, uh, you know, about his youth opportunity guarantee, uh, his, to respond to the needs of young people, uh, and also saving the planet. You know, all of these things uh, are big agendas that need to be addressed. Um, I'm going to pass to you, Josh, for any reflections and also the uh, poll results that, that we put on way back this morning. Thanks, Anne. Um, I think in terms of reflections from me, I'll try and I'll try and keep it short and sweet. And um, I guess something that, I ha that I've not put on today yet is that I am still technically just about statistically a young person. So as, as a young person, what is it that I want to see going forward? And that is, I think, and I suppose somebody who's also in a policy type role and, and is wanting to, to grow his expertise, um, is greater join up from government um, for far too often things are looked at in silos and that also there's not much conversation going on we heard from Ian today um, of DWP how how he's bringing in that knowledge from DfE and I think it's really important that government look at doing that across across all departments um, and the second major reflection um, is just that I think I think for young people right now, they need their voices heard. They feel left out. They, they feel there's not space for them and they're really struggling with their mental health. And, and as somebody who's got, I've got bipolar disorder and as somebody who's accessed mental health services during the pandemic, it was difficult for me to get those services. And I'm somebody who's already in the system and who's heavily involved in the system, who has two or three people making sure my medication's right, making sure everything is in place. And if that's happening for somebody who is that deeply involved in the system, imagine what it's like for the young people whose anxiety, depression and other um, mental health issues have, have arisen and grown during the pandemic. So I think we need to listen to young people more and young people right now are telling us that their mental health is, is not OK and we really need to look into that. So they're the kind of two major reflections from me, I think. Um, and then moving on to the poll results, if they are ready. Lovely. Here they come up. So, yeah, so we asked, obviously, is the job done? And I think overwhelmingly um, we've heard that, that no, it's not. It's not done. Um, and there's kind of two, two major reflections here that it's been a good start. I think we can see that from the 55 percent who said that we're going in the right direction. So the plan for jobs for that says to me that it was, a, it was a good place to start and it's done its job during um, a time of crisis. But where do we go next? And and then the other 42 percent, which is still a, a, a a big chunk of people um, who are saying that we need a major shift. Um, so that major shift now has to focus on the, the green economy, the leveling up agenda, um, the making sure that all these, all this money pumped into the initiatives is not just cut off that right now because it seems like the job is done. Um, when we know we've heard today from from all of our speakers that there are undercurrents of struggles that were there before the before the pandemic struck and have have stayed um, and and if not got worse during the pandemic. Um, so. I, I'm not particularly surprised on, on those. I don't know if you've got anything else to add to that. <laughs> no, I, I suppose uh, was it a rhetorical question that we asked at the top of the uh, event, which is, is it job done? But uh, it's very important. We have a lot of diff attendees from right across uh, the different sectors all saying the same thing. You know, nobody has said, yes, we can sit back and the job is done, which is a powerful message uh, to the minister from this morning uh, and to those officials who have joined us today as well as everyone else. So uh, I, I just want to say a really huge thanks, especially to you, Josh, for uh, co-hosting this with me. Uh, I wanted to try something different for this event where young people, apprentices and others have been a real part of these events and not just talked about. Uh, I feel it's been a success. Uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed it too, Josh. Uh, and also Cushy, who chaired panel one, and also Yamin, who was a part of one of our breakouts. We, we need to do this together. 
Uh, and that to me is, is, is what I want to get across to everybody uh, who's spoken today. Um, I want to say a huge thanks to the dream team behind the scenes, Helena and Rasheen at Learning and Work Institute. They have been absolutely phenomenal. You don't know how many buttons and things we've had to press to make this happen, but they've made it all happen. And a really big, again, thank you to Impetus and the Edge Foundation, who, as I say, are just really going above and beyond, particularly for those groups of young people who may not be being particularly served well at this point in time. It just leaves me to say, you know, good chairs always end early. So hopefully you can now have uh, your rest and your cup. I certainly am going to have a rest and a cup of tea. I know that. Um, there will be a poll up which will say, did you enjoy this event? Was it along the right lines? Uh, and we really want your feedback as to whether we should be doing it more like this in the future. Um, and thank you to all of the attendees, all of the panelists, all of the speakers, all of the chairs, all of you for joining us today to talk about youth employment and skills. Thank you very much and goodbye.